you, Lord, for this pleasant day. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of our children. Amen. We thank you for the allies of the Lord. Amen. We thank you for the resources you've given to us in God's people, Church. Father Almighty, take me the name of Jesus to bless them. Amen. And once again, we are going to your words, O Lord. We are now going to sow the seeds of the gospel into our hearts. We beseech thee, O Lord, to let every seed that we plant this morning find fertile ground in our hearts, O Lord. Do not let us be hearers of their words alone, but do us also. At the end of this message, Father, never let our lives be the same again. We thank you, O Lord, for this grace. Thank you, Father. Speak to your servant. I know it might not go, Lord. Consecrate the message yourself. We trust in you, we believe in you. Because without you, we cannot do anything. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Bible reading will be coming from the book of. First John chapter three from verses one to twenty four. First John chapter three verses one to twenty four. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we will be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet that we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope takes on him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins, and no one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Amen. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his sin abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Amen. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for this reason, and for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the children. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Amen. Amen. Yeah. We will know by this that we are of the truth and we assure our heart before him. In whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all. Beloved, 
the Baba heart does not condemn us without confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandment and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. This is His commandment that we believe in the name of His Son Jesus Christ and love one another just as He commanded us. The one who keeps His commandment abides in Him and He in Him. We know by this that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. And this is the end of the reading. May God bless His holy word. Amen. The topic of the message for this morning is the dividends of Christian habits. The dividends of Christian habits. The dividends of Christian habits can also be deemed to mean the benefit of possessing Christian habits. And what then is the meaning of that word habit? There are some similar definitions of this word, and the one more relevant to our message this morning is defined thus. A habit is the usual condition of a state of a person or a thing either natural or acquired, regarded as something that had or possessed and finally retained. The term habit has at least three applications in English. The personal habit is one which shows a habitual routine that is not consciously considered. In other words, habits are like our second nature, our behavior, the way we live our life, the way we do things, the way we talk, the way we relate with one another, the way we think, and the way we relate with God and man. Habits, therefore, can be manifested in many forms. If it is not Christian habits, it could be good habits, or bad habits, or devilish habits, and so on. And each one of them has its own dividends or its own merit. But since we are Christians, we shall focus our attention more on the benefits of Christian habits over any other kind of habits. A non-believer, in Christ Jesus can also have good habits and display but incomplete good habits. But when you have fully understood and cultivated Christian habits, you have also cultivated all the attributes that go with good habits. In other words, before you can be said to possess Christian habits, you must have got good habits since everything about our Lord and Savior is pure, is righteous, and exemplary good. If you cultivate Christ in your daily life, people that you are relating with or coming across every day on the street will easily recognize this trait in you. And before you say many words, they will ask you, are you a Christian? And when you ask back, my friend, why do you ask? His answer will be, I can see it in you. The way you talk, the way you behave, the way you conduct yourself, the way you respond to people who annoy you, and the way you attend to people in distress. I've never seen you losing your temper or cursing anybody, but always smiling, and looking unruffled even in the face of provocation, as if you two are not of flesh and blood like the rest of us. Always thanking God for whatever comes your way, you don't complain. You never worry because you firmly believe that God is in fully in control of your life no matter what. Yes. To fully appreciate what we are considering this morning, let us try and see the difference between good habits and bad habits. It's like comparing the taste of honey with something very bitter, like bitter leaf or bile. Unfortunately, not many of our youth in America today know what or how could they live or buy this life? Since all their lives, they have only been exposed to candies, to chocolate, to can coke or soda. And the only thing they know, if it is not spinach, it will be lettuce or cabbage or cassava leaves. Amen. 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 But no bitter leaves, except those that grew up back home in Africa. Bitter leaf or bad is very bitter to taste and they spoil the whole mouth, just like bad habits, which corrupt good manners. 
But the money is sweet. Even babies, also with the licking their lips, if you put a drop of honey in their mouth, how then can we walk out our ways back to good habits in order to be able to cultivate Christian habits? Let us see what the Holy Bible hinted us about habits. We shall read from the following scriptures, the book of Numbers, 33, 50 to 56. And the Lord spake unto Moses, in the place of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye have passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures and destroy all their molten images and quit, block down all their high places. And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein. For I have given you the land to possess it. And ye shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families. And to the more ye shall give the more inheritance, and to the fewer ye shall give less inheritance, every man's inheritance shall be the place where his lot falleth. According to the tribes of your fathers ye shall inherit. But if you will not drag out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land where ye dwell. Moreover, it shall come to pass that I shall do unto you as I thought to do unto them. Now, what warning or message was God giving to the children of Israel here? These people. The inhabitants of the land had already cultivated many bad habits, such as idol worshipping, fornication, adultery, drunkenness, unlike as against the children of Israel who are still polluted and uncorrupted by bad habits. The elders say, Bad company corrupts good manners, as I have been forced to learn from my bitter experience, which is cited below. When I was admitted into the college, I was sent to the boarding house. After two years, I joined a gang of high society boys, and we used to climb the fence to attend late night parties downtown. As the saying goes, that all this for the thief, but one day for the owner. Amen. Our schoolmaster decided to conduct his routine check in all the dormitories. When he discovered that some boys were missing from their beds, a thorough search was conducted and it was discovered that the bundle of clothes that I rolled together like a sleeping panda <laughs> Don't laugh now. was not breathing like me, but a dummy panda. Since I was surrounded up with the rest of the boys, the second day, we were all lined up before the whole college assembly. Oh, what a shame and humiliation. And I was sent packing away from the comfort of the boarding house where we were served our three square meals a day and all our clothes were collected and sent to the laundry. For the rest of the three years in the college, I had to share a room downtown with two other boys, catering for all the needs that I had taken for granted. And ever since, whenever they are telling the story of Adam and Eve being driven out of the Garden of Eden to become a tiller of ground and to struggle to survive, I realized the difference between life in the Garden of Eden and life in the world we are now forced to live. Amen. And this has been the reason why to today I never take any situation for granted. And I shake my head whenever I see some people despite the fact that they have never really enjoyed any better situation in their life before. When they are offered a comfortable shelter to solve their problems they say it's a bit the annoying bad habits of empty braggarts and mm. complaining instead of being grateful Amen. for what they are offered and until they lose all of mm. the cost of their mouth. Mm. Secondly, you decided to get married at long last. But you don't intend to do away with your friends with whom you go to clubs, bingo, poker betting or gambling houses. What expectation can you have about the outcome of your marriage? Today we have many jubilee delinquencies 
among the youth, among the young women. And most of them trace the root of their problems to one form or other of their mother's bad habits, such as alcoholism, drug addiction, prostitution, senselessly wandering about always abandoning hope to visit friends every weekend, indulging in bad habits of idle gossiping and so on instead of coming to church. The second that we're going to consider is replacing bad habits with good ones. God told Moses that before the Israelites settled the promised land, they should drive out the wicked inhabitants and destroy their idols. In Colossians 3, Paul encourages us to live as Christians in the same manner, throwing away our old ways of living and moving ahead into our new life of obedience to God and faith in Jesus Christ. Like the Israelites moving into the promised land, we can destroy the wickedness in our life or we can settle down and live with it. To move in and possess the new life, we must drive out the sinful thoughts and practices to make room for the new. When we now read the book of Deuteronomy 12, 1 to 32, we shall see how God laid down guidelines and specific instructions on how his people should live and the type of habits they should cultivate in order to please him. In verses 1 to 2, when you drive out the nations that live there, you must destroy all the places where they worship, they are gods high on the mountain, up on the hill, and under every green tree. Break down their altars and smash their sacred pillars, burn their Asherah poles, and cut down their calf idols. Erase the names of their gods from those places. In verse 13, be careful that you do not offer your bond offerings in every cultic place you see. For in the place which the Lord chooses in one of your tribes, therefore you shall offer your bond offering, and there you shall do all that I command you. In verse 17, you are not allowed to eat within your gates the tithes of your grain, or your new wine, or oil, or the first bone of your herd, or flock, or any of your free way offering for the contribution of your land. In verse 19, be careful that you do not forsake the Levites as long as you live in your land. You will not forsake our pastors today. That's why the fact that they cater for our spiritual needs. We still impose levy on them and expect them to share our financial burden. It is an abomination. It is a cause upon us and a sin against God's commandments. In verse 23 to 25, only be sure not to eat the blood, for the blood is the life, and you shall not eat the life with the flesh. You shall not eat it. You shall pour it on the ground as water. You shall not eat it, so that it will be well with you and your sons after you. For you will be doing what is right in the sight of God. And in verses 31 to 32, you shall not behave thus towards the Lord your God, for every abominable act which the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. For they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire for their gods. Whatever I command you shall be careful to do, you shall not add or take away from it. Many of us who are now born again Christians, before we became followers of Jesus Christ, we used to date as many girlfriends as possible. We smoked pot, marijuana, cannabis, we, we sneak hero, we experiment with sorts of prescription drugs, we even we are here is like women. And sometimes we consider it exciting to participate in night parties and mixing our drinks with all sorts of stimulants. Despite the fact that we are told that all these practices are the methods designed by Satan to keep us in perpetual bondage, we still sneak back to them, hoping it's all right, since my fellow Christian brothers and sisters are still friendly with me. It will be better if you take heed before they give up on you. We read about the priest who after more than 20 years as a parish priest in Northern Ireland, the reports of the sexual practices which victims were either too embarrassed or scared to report were eventually exposed 
many young boys were molested, while many young girls, as at that time, suffered sexual harassment and molestation from him. But because of a recent sexual harassment report from a member, all the hidden immoral hearts of 20 years became open just because he could not replace his poor habits with the good ones after becoming a priest. We learned about the life of a judge of a people's court, how he went to jail for about four times for various offenses such as drug trafficking and smoking to stealing. But when he had his own personal contact or encounter with Jesus Christ, he changed from his bad ways to now becoming a judge today. He uses his time or lifetime experience and conversion to change the lives of criminals brought before him that there is always hope and chance for reformation or restitution if only you try and have faith. Zacchaeus was a publican and a tax collector. When he encountered Jesus in Luke 19, 1-10, on quote, and Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day salvation come to this house, for as much as he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And after admitting Jesus into his house, he knew that on that day salvation entered into his house, and he turned a new leaf, and he had redressed all the atrocities he had committed in the past. And we also read about the story of a harlot, Rahab, in Joshua 2, 1 to 14, who allowed herself to be used by God to fulfill the capture process of Jericho. I am sure, after the wall of Jericho fell, and only her and that of her families were saved, she never went back to her prostitution. Verses 11 to 14, and as soon as we heard, we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in heaven. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that ye will also show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token. And that ye will save alive my father, and my mother, and my brethren, and my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And the men answer her, Our life for yours. If ye utter not this our business, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will dig and live and truly with thee. Amen. 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 Our third point bad habits deserve no mercy. Bad habits deserve no mercy. When taking over a nation, the Israelites were supposed to destroy every pagan altar and idol in the land. God knew it would be easy for them to change their beliefs if they started using those altars. So nothing was to remain that might tempt them to worship idols, which we should ruthlessly find and remove any center of false worship in our life. These may be activities, attitudes, possessions, relationships, places, or habits, or anything that tends us to turn our hearts from God and do wrong. We should never flatter ourselves by thinking we are too strong to be tempted. If we learn that lesson the hard way, the Bible explains this further in 1 John 3, 1 to 24, which we have just read at the beginning of our message, and verses 9 to 10 reads, No one who is born of God practices sin, because the seed of God abides in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. By then the children of God, and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. And let us consider this point. One, how many of us today, after we have been supposedly born again into the body of Christ, still find it difficult to resign our membership from our upcalls or fraternity clubs because those are the centers from where we get our contracts 
and business connections. Two, we found out that the only way to impose our authority and power over our fellow neighbors and our co-workers is to remain aggressive, vengeful, vindictive, and overbearing. When we are now become born again and Christ's teaching told us to love our neighbors as ourselves and to do unto others as we want them to do unto us, refusing to drop the old garment we suddenly put us in the old life. Three, our possession can be our stumbling block in gaining the kingdom of God. Our uh, God told the rich young man to go and sell all he possessed and give to the poor. He first sad and left, preferring to stay in his own life of materialism. How many of us today have missed the way to heaven by still preferring to serve our possession rather than God? You cannot serve two masters. The fourth point is God's power. We all have areas where temptation is strong and the habits that are hard to conquer. These weaknesses give the devil a foothold. So we must deal with our areas of vulnerability. If we are struggling with a particular sin, however, these verses are not directed at us. Even if for the time we seem to keep on sinning, John is not talking about people whose victories are still incomplete but still making efforts. He is talking about people who make a practice of sinning and looking for ways to justify it. As we read in 1 John 3, 9 to 12, no one who is born of God practices sin, because his sins abide in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. For this is the children of God, and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, no, the one who does not love his brother, for this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his brother did, we are evil, and his brothers we are righteous. Now, there are three steps for God's help. One of them is to seek the power of the Holy Spirit and God's word. There is no tribulation and there is no habit that is too difficult to overcome. Amen. All we have to do is to seek God's help. Yes. And how to seek God's help? Yes. There are three steps in which you can seek God's help. The first step is to seek the power of the Holy Spirit and to seek the God's word. Amen. Now, in Psalm 19, 14, it reads, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Two, Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Chosen by God for this new life of love. I dress in the wardrobe he picked out for me. And they are compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline, a moving temper, content with second place, quick to forgive and offense. I forgive as quickly as completely as the master forgave me. And regardless of what else I put on, I wear love. It is my basic all purpose garment. I never want to be without it. The second step is to stay away from tempting situations. Matthew 12, 34 to 35. Out of the fullness, the overflow, the superabundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man from his inner good treasure brings forth good things. And the evil man out of his inner storehouse brings forth evil things. Then in 1 Corinthians 6 12, everything is permissible, allowable, and lawful for me. But not all things are helpful or good for me to do or expedient and profitable when considered with other things. Everything is lawful for me, but I will not become the slave of anything or be brought under his power. Amen. 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 And the third step, Seek the help of the body of Christ. Yes. 
They open to their willingness to hold you accountable and to pray for you. Ephesians 4, 29. Let no foul or polluting language or evil words nor unwholesome or worthless talk ever come out of my mouth. Amen. But only such speech as is good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of others. Glory. As is befitting to the need and the occasion that it may be a blessing and give grace God's favor to those who hear it. And in 2 Corinthians 15:58, I am standing in firm, letting nothing to move me. I give myself fully to the work of the Lord, because I know that my labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. 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 Yes, thank you. And then how do we start to maintain good habits? How do we start to maintain good habits? Christian stewardship and tithing. The Bible makes the purpose of tithing very clear. To so put God first in our life, we have to give God the best and the best of what we are. For example, what do we do first with our money? Show what we value most. What we do first with our money, it shows what we value most. Giving the first part of our pay packet to God immediately focuses our attention on Him. It also reminds us that we all have belonged to Him. A habit of regular tithing can keep God at the top of our priority, our priority list, and give us a proper perspective on everything else we have. And let me read that one again. A habit of regular tithing can keep God at the top of our priority list and give us a proper perspective on everything else we have. In other words, God can never forget you because you, you have not forsaken God. If you take God seriously, God will also take you seriously. Amen. That is what it so the development of this attitude of proportionate giving as adopted in many Orthodox churches has led to the adoption of the principle commonly referred to as Christian stewardship and tithing. Christian stewardship frees us from poverty mentality People of little faith, always afraid of tomorrow, as if to say it is by their power they do pray. Christian worship refers to an attitude, our attitude towards ourselves and our world. It has to do with all that we are and have. Most basically, the understanding of life to mankind and holds man responsible for the use of all the things that he has created. Uh, this is basically what is meant each time the priest recites the words from the Old Testament we are, we are pouring us over a remnant of the disease during the pioneer service. The earth is the Lord's and fullness thereof, the world and all that dwell therein. Ye are dust, and to dust you will return. Yes. God Christian re requires that one that we recognize ourselves and our world as belonging to God. Second, we affirm all life, all possession, all talent, all gifts, both actual and potential as entrusted to us for our lifetime use and management. As we saw in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Two or three, we have to acknowledge that we are not only responsible, but only accountable for how we exercise this stewardship. As we read in Malachi 3, 7 to 11. And then in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, we begin to share a portion of God's gift to us with the rest of His creation out of gratitude for His best loving us. It is when we have fully appreciated all these facts that everything we have in life belongs to Him, that we never worry our head or our heart anymore trying to find out from pastors or priests what percentage of my belonging or possession do I owe God? He owes everything, including your life. No longer we carelessly sneer a bit of our time, our talent, or our resources, and use the balance without regard for the needs of God and others. The question will no longer be about 10%, but about 100%. Having been made and we are of this phase of life, we need not to take stock of how we expend our resources. 
For our Lord said, Where your treasure is, there will your heart also be. For the Christian, the practice of Christian stewardship is in reality an autobiographical statement or demonstration of your faith. And we now come to worship. Jesus went to the synagogue as usual. Even though he was the perfect son of God, and his local church undoubtedly left him much to be desired. Jesus attended services every week. His example makes our excuses for not attending church sound weak and self serving Make regular worship a part of your life. And let us see what the Bible teaches us in Matthew 5, 5 to 15. We read verse 5. Now about prayer. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogue where everyone can see them. I assure you that all that are all the rewards they will ever get if our Lord Jesus Christ had the habit of attending services every week. What excuse do we have? Then to say the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Unknowingly, we are ignorantly putting a cost upon our head. Because that body that you are causing will always be weak, as your mouth pronounces. Yes. And we now come to the last consideration, which is prayer. Some people, especially the religious leaders, wanted to be seen as holy and as public prayer was one to get their attention. Jesus saw through their self-righteous act, however, and thought that the essence of prayer is not public style, but private communication with God. There is a place for public prayer. But to pray only where others will notice you indicates that your real audience is not God. When he was asked by his disciples, Master, teach us how to pray. And he said, Can we all stand please and recite the last prayer? Master, teach us how to pray. And he said, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, for deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May God bless you all. Thank you very much. It is now time for altar call. If you would like to receive a prayer, please come up to the front.